Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to add up on the Edup Experience podcast, where we make education your business. And that we that see already, I'm already fumbling over my words, but that's okay. I've had you know the reason why because I had three cups of coffee. Wait, you know, I'm waiting for my first guest. I put in so much fuel into my body, and now it's just like blurting out. Uh, but this is, of course, Dr. Joe Salustio. I'm here at Element 451. Engage. And we are very excited to be here with our first guest of the day. And I'm going to bring her in right now onto the microphone. She's excited. Here she is. She is the one and only Daniela Norden, and she is the Senior Engagement Specialist at Element 451. Daniela, what is going on? Good morning. I think that the reason you're nervous isn't the coffee is because of my history. I just told Joe that I used to interview people on podcasts, so you're intimidated, right, Joe? That's a fact. That's a fact. <laughs> yes, ma'am, I am. Uh, I, and uh, I, I, I'm humbled that you're here because you have a big job. And so let's just kind of start from the top. What is the senior engagement strategist do for Element 451? Yeah, this is such a good question. So I usually talk about this in two buckets, right? Mm. Um, one bucket, my responsibility is to help our partners and clients optimize their CRM usage. So I'm responsible for adoption, retention, um, uh, optimization, and engagement. Um, so I work with clients to figure out how to better use their CRM. And then the other bucket is I lead our professional services division. Oh, wow. So I consult um, on clients on marketing strategies and we do training. We do we provide just a suite of services. So two big buckets for one role. Pretty big job. Amazing. <laughs> oh, thank you. We, um, uh, you know, it's funny because change management is a big deal, right? So as you go, CRMs are, are a part of the higher ed ecosystem. You have the CRM and you have the SIS and you have to make these two things work or else you're dead in the water. And when you move from a CRM to a system like Element, um, that comes with change adoption. It comes with, um, what, fear. It comes with mm -hmm. excitement. It, there's a lot of, there's a big time change curve. And sometimes people will not get on board right away because they're used to doing things. We talk about this all the time in the podcast. I've always, I've, uh, I've, that's the way we've always done it, the seven worst words in business. And it's like, well, it doesn't do what, I, what I'm used to having it do. Well, that's because what you're used to having it do isn't what it should be doing. And so here's what you sh it should be doing. And now you have to be the one that bridges over. That's hard work, changing the minds and hearts of people who are really set in their ways, isn't it? It's uh, it's incredibly difficult, but I'm actually working with a partner right now who's going through this, right? And you mentioned the um, CRM and, C and SIS like relationship especially. Yep. So we've got a current partner who is using Element for their applications, but then making their decisions in Banner. And Element can do that for them. So, Epic. Yeah, so we're actually walking them through the process of translating that Banner um, decisioning process, their checklist, like how they admit students and have changed it for them in Element. And the crux of all of this is trust. Trust mm. in the technology, trust in me, you know, trust in the team that I'm bringing to the table. Because if they don't trust us, like on our recommendations and what I'm doing, then forget it. Right? It's almost like trust is more important than the actual system usage itself because 100%. you're not going to be open. You're going to have the open mind. The yes. system will do what the system does. But if you don't believe it, yes, then you're not going to do it. Yes. Um, the other like crucial part of this, too, is we've got a really great leader on the partner side who's pushing his team because that leadership buy in, especially for change management. It, and you can't overemphasize the importance of that. We really need somebody on that side of the table who's helping the team understand how this will improve process, workload, brain drain, all of the things that I'm sure everybody's been talking about at this conference, um, having somebody who's in a leadership role, a VP who can push that has just been instrumental to the success of, of this particular project. You know, you're ta we're talking about a lot about AI while we're here. And this is a, f I feel like it's a funny thing for higher ed. AI, we have, AI is here, it's here to stay, it's gonna dominate our lives. If it isn't already, it's, it's being used in certain ways we didn't even know about before mm -hmm. ChatGPT. Now we know about more ways that we're using AI. High Red, though, has a lot of people that go, I mean, I had, I had a conversation with somebody, uh, and I said this uh, yesterday in one of the podcasts, and he, he's pretty technologically savvy, and I said, oh, chat GPT, he goes, yeah, yeah, chat GPT, or chat G, uh, what did he say, GBT, and so he he didn't actually know what, it, he, he's like, oh, yeah, I've heard about it, but I haven't been using it. So how do you, a part of this adoption is not just to element, it's, it's about mm -hmm. technology. 
And is are, are we ready for it? It's so interesting. We higher ed, we the world. Um, yeah. you know, Here's the plan. I think that's a that's a really big question. Um, I really liked if at this conference, JC Vanilla's presentation, he ended on a note that was like, don't be afraid to try. And I think that was so important because that's big the, time, right? Well, yeah, the questions he was get he was getting from the crowd were are there legal repercussions or are there ethical, you know, we're scared, we're scared to try this and we need to know, you know, what comes next. And he was like, don't be scared. Just try it. Just put it out there. Your students are doing it. Right. 100%. And it's like, you got to be where they are. You have to adapt to those student expectations. And all of this does go back again to that trust. You know, so a lot of times when I talk to our partners, I'm trying to find those quick wins. I'm trying to find the things that make a difference in their day to day lives that gets them to trust the technology. And when you can prove that, it's a lot easier to help them come along that learning curve. I was thinking this morning that students might be coming to the table with their own set of AI tools that they're expecting the university to replicate. Mm -hmm. Like if I if I'm coming through high school now, uh, or, or and I'm an adult student and I've, I've, you know, I was, it's funny because I'm presenting later today and I'm writing down my favorite AI tools to talk to the audience about. And I'm going, man, I use these tools. If I have to go somewhere and do something and learn, I'm going to use these tools. I, I would expect that the university might be giving me access to these tools. Mm. You know, this, we have to prepare for a totally different type of student with what we're doing and how we fashion our systems to serve the student who knows how to hack stuff. Yeah. You well, know what I mean? I mean, fi figuratively speaking, of and, course. And not even hack stuff, Joe, but like, um, I, I want to go back to something Chris Quinn said about that cognitive learning. Like, yeah. you want the type of student who can hack this. You want the type of student who's cognitively adapting and thinking about ways to make these tools work for them. That person is going to be successful in their career yeah. post-college, is going to give back to, Nailed it. you know, your university. So absolutely we should be encouraging like these the skill set and giving them access because you want somebody who can think like that mm. as you, you you talk a lot about trust and this is a trust is just the center of everything how do you be, build trust huh. i mean what is your because people have asked me that before and it's like a, it's not like you open the notebook and go here's my four step plan to build trust it's relational right i mean how do you do that to better serve your clients so that they trust you I wish I had a four-step plan. I'm gonna now. That's my next presentation. Here's your four-step plan. It's fuzzy math. <laughs> figure out how to trust people. Um, this is going to sound super cheesy. I'm a persuader on the PI index, oh. and I think I rely a lot on that. I think it's a little bit of evidence. So here's an example of what has worked. Throw you know? me a freaking bone here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> here's what could work for you. Um, you know, and then I, I hate to say it, but sort of the glibness of of explaining yes you can you can do this you can trust in me i think the other thing that we um that i rely on too is that leadership buy-in if it's from artists you know yeah. the ceo if it's from my team member or if it's from finding that partner it's having um strength in numbers you know so having evidence having more people explain it to you um and being able to show the difference in that and then uh, this is this is probably cheesy willing to fall on your sword when it goes wrong yes <laughs> <laughs> okay enough of that one. it's so it's true but though. keep going i like the choir to behind you <laughs> but it, it's true it's like you got to be willing to like take one for the team and say this might not work i don't know if it's going to work but if it doesn't work then i'm still going to be here with you and we're going to figure out a way to make it work yeah um so i think i i hope that our clients see that in me and say you know we're going to figure out something that works for you and if it doesn't it's on me not you you've worked on both sides I you have. worked within higher education now you're working for a higher ed tech company do you miss it? Do you, I mean, no, I don't, the answer is no, I don't miss it. I love working for Element 451. But I mean, you, you, you the, part of that trust is you need to know what I am going through. I am in the mud and I am in the dirt and I'm talking to students and they're making me cry at night because it's so hard work. If you don't get that, my trust level for you may not be as high. How important is that when you go and you talk to clients and go, look, I know, I've been there, I've done this, I get it. Mm -hmm. 
extremely important. Um, everybody always asks, uh, you know, I was on the marketing and communications team at Skidmore. So I think my role is that liaison to admissions because admissions doesn't understand a lot of times what marketing is doing yep. and marketing knows admissions has to fill, you know, that class, get those right students. But the way we think we're doing it might not match up with their process. So being able to rely on the work that I did before uh, it has been incredibly helpful. Do I miss it? Does anyone miss <laughs> <laughs> the sort of red tape and procedure that higher ed, I think, is notorious oh, for? I don't know. Such bureaucracy. Such bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. um, I do miss um, the the community, though, because there's something about like being on campus, walking to the dining hall, going to meetings together um, that that you don't get maybe so much in this remote like atmosphere. Yeah. But what's different about ed tech and maybe element in general, I we never got to push the envelope the way that we do now. We talked about AI, you know, we talked about some of the products that that we're building. I think I it was on the individual on a campus to push that forward. And I'm very familiar with that role. So when I find somebody in a seat on campus who's doing that, I want to help that person. Bullseye. It's hard to do to push when you're, you're one person within a large machine, mm. a bureaucratic machine, to bring innovation to the table and have somebody go, fund that. Let's go. It's a whole lot easier when you you know when you're an ed tech company you can go in and you can show the result from other clients and case studies and so on so you get to advocate right mm -hmm. you're the coach you're the you're the person who's advocating for this innovator within campus you know as we move forward and we talk about students um student needs are changing the the you know we have um uh, enrollment issues we have brand identity issues within higher education and technology can help us fill that gap. How deep do you go into that with your clients? Like, hey, look, we, you got to have a brand. It has to be solid. It has to be, you know, um, I, I guess a better way to say it is what makes one institution better than another or different than another? In five seconds or less, can you clarify and crystallize your value proposition? And most of higher ed goes, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think the challenge with higher ed, everybody wants to be, how are we like Harvard? How are we like Yale? How are we like Princeton? You know what? How are you different from Harvard? How are you different from that's Yale? Right. How are you different from Princeton? Um, and that's a lot of the things that we talk about. A lot of our clients and partners are community colleges, and mm. they don't have the resources to really think about brand differentiators. So a lot of my conversations are, how do you talk about price? How do you talk about pace? Because that's a Ooh, lot of big one. a lot of adult learners. How long will it take me to get that degree? How flexible is it? And we spend a lot of time crafting messages around uh, those points and figuring out how to motivate people, how to compel them to take action. So it is a huge, huge part. Even if you're not thinking about it, you're probably doing it, and you don't know that you're doing it um, in almost your everyday, you know, yeah. admissions and enrollment marketing work. You bring up p p pace is such a uh, crucial thing and I don't think we talk about it mm -mm. enough you know we we know degrees and we know credit and non-credit and for credit and blah 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 and it's like what's the academic calendar how are you moving through right? what type of educational pathways are you offering to close the distance from point A to point B that in itself is an is a marketable trait for a college or university if you understand it Right. Absolutely. And I don't think we say it enough. Now, there's some big online universities that do it well. But for the majority of institutions, at least in the traditional sense, we don't do a good job of saying, here's how long it's going to take you to finish. Yeah. Right. And it's one of the top questions. And like, don't shy away from it. Lean into it. I think people yes. think that it um, diminishes maybe and that maybe that's not the right word but i think a lot of well if you go fast if you're going to the degree faster than the educational quality is diminished exactly uh, no. and that's not the case and it's like you need understanding those student expectations understanding those needs means proactively answering those questions and getting out ahead of it because that is going to set you apart the person the student who's searching how long will it take me to finish this degree can i take it while i'm working full-time can i take it while i'm a working parent is more apt to trust you yep. going back to trust and being able to answer that question than having to dig around and trying to find those answers talk about the professional services of uh, side of your job and what you do and what you can uh, offer 
yeah. colleges and universities? Um, we've got three buckets. Uh, we do marketing strategies. So we're talking like your full funnel, prospective student, current student, marketing strategies, everything from discovery, audience messaging, tactical campaign work. Oh, um, yeah. We make recommendations for your digital advertising. We'll write your copy for you. Mm. We do email marketing. So your marketing automation. We'll build your workflows. We'll build your audience segments in your wow. CRM. Um, we'll write your email for you. And then content marketing, too. So talking about just a full strategy for what does your social look like? Um, you know, what each phase of your from awareness to nurture to conversion, where you should be, what should be on your website, what should be on your email, what should be on your text messaging, and then a suite of training. So a lot of times our uh, partners will come to us and say, hey, we need to build out an application or we need to transfer that decision process from banner to element. So we'll do training, we'll do your workflow builds, we'll build your applications, um, anything, you name it. Yeah, That's a lot. It's a lot. That's a big job. It's not have. just me, Joe. I got yeah, a team. I so. <laughs> well, I figured that you'd have to have a team. How you, you went through a lot of marketing jargon. Oh, yes. Did and, I? And you, you did. No, and I and I get it. But somebody is sitting here going, uh, we're not doing that. Um, what is she talking about? Because you just ran through this like full life cycle management and, and are schools doing all of that? You know, I mean, probably not, right? Yeah. So it's interesting. Um, you definitely see the full spectrum, right? And you've got the, um, the institutions who pay a lot of money for the full, you know, um, brand differentiator and that whole, you know, experience. Outrageous. And then you've got the institutions who are doing it on a much smaller scale, uh, niche based. Give um, me a break. And may not even know that they are doing it. Hmm. Then you've got the institutions who recognize that they need to be doing something and have no idea where to start. Right. Right. Um, and a lot of times that's where we come in and say, hey, you want to grow this population of students. You're looking for those adult learners. You're looking for, uh, I don't even, regionally, we hear a lot of, like, in our county, we want to grow those students. What do I do? Um, and we come in and say, you know, hey, a digital advertising campaign, even for this much money or these keywords, um, you know, doing paid advertising or even just, like, email marketing, starting to nurture, a lot of folks ignore their admitted um, students who aren't depositing right? what? and they just don't know what to do with them. And that's like a really low hanging yes. fruit that I can say, here's three emails that gets them back into your funnel and you should revisit them at this time in the cycle, you know, next year. So um, yeah, it runs, it really runs the game. It, it's, 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 you know, it's important to know when you're dealing with a partner like element 451 and you think about this, you brought on this partner element 451 they have as much stake in the game of helping you grow, right? Because you pay for the service and the way Element 451, probably part of the business model, makes money as the student count grows and that, that technology serves more students. So they have a vested interest in helping your college or institution grow. Mm -hmm. And so the, the services that you provide, the advice that you have, it's all toward not just use the system better, it's go recruit more students. Yes. We want you to recruit more students, right? I think that we forget that a lot of times in higher ed that we work with a partner, that partner has a vested interest in helping us grow as fast as humanly possible. Yeah, it's all about meeting your goals and your needs, right? And meeting them quicker. So a lot of times I'll say we can help you get there quicker. We're also the experts in your CRM. Yep. So like when it comes to that technology and not understanding maybe the nuances or the best way to do something, we can we bring that to the table. So we can work with you knowing the product as well as we do, knowing the capabilities of the product as well as we do the best way to help you reach those goals. What do you think of this conference so far, Danielle? Is it is it everything you hoped it would be? I mean, is this the best conference you've ever been to from the location to like the presentation? Engage. I mean, it's been phenomenal. Engage. I, I think it's um rare that uh, and I told somebody this the other day that you want to hang out with the people that you work with like mm -hmm. after hours, right? It's been a long Excellent. time since I've felt like that. And that's absolutely true on the client side and on my colleague's side. So I've been thrilled. I'm presenting later today too. And it's really nice because I get to wrap everything up. Um, all the things that we heard about in the product launch, uh, all of the AI and I'm the last session and I'm really excited to bring that to the table. Nothing wrong with hanging out with your colleagues. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, there's, it might've 
have been a few of that uh, going on last night, but we're not going to keep that here. If you're not here, you don't know. You don't know. I will tell you, this has been an absolute pleasure, Daniela, to have you on. By the way, one of my favorite names of all time is Daniela. Thank you. In fact, when I talked to my wife, a little story about me, my uh, daughter's name is Gemma. And I had two names. I was Gemma and Daniela. And th we were like, I wanted Daniela so bad. I liked Gemma just as much, and we ended up uh, picking Gemma. But Daniela was in the mix. No it's kidding. It's a great name. It's a, you know, my wife's Italian, and so it's a big Italian name. And I was and born in Italy. Where are you? Really? Uh, and I remember my I was born on an Air Force base, and my mom was going to name me Ashley. And when I was born, all of the Italian nurses were like, "You cannot name no. her an American name. <laughs> she yep. was born in Italy. That's She's right. got to have an Italian name." So I, I love that. I oh. would be happy if you if you have other kids or grandkids to share that name. No more. No more. <laughs> no more. No more kids. Same. Well, it's going to be a while on the grad kid thing. We're, we're going to have that conversation off. And ladies and gentlemen, my guest today, your guest today, here she is. She's Daniela Norton. She's senior engagement strategist at Element 451. Did you enjoy your time in the podcast here? This was incredibly uh, relaxing and more comfortable than I anticipated, Joe. So thank you I'm very much. I'm going to take that as a compliment. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, you've just ed upped. <laughs>